so as we've heard many, many times, uh, we need uh, sub-resolution modeling for um, for handling a lot of the problems of interest in astrophysics. Um, I highlight three of them here: AGN feedback in galaxies and in galaxy clusters, star formation within giant molecular clouds, and uh, and one that hasn't really been talked about as much: uh, uh, turbulence and uh, non-thermal particle acceleration uh, in the intercluster medium. And all of these involve large uh, dynamical ranges uh, that cannot necessarily be uh, spanned by adaptive resolution techniques like adaptive mesh refinement. Um, even uh, a challenge for observations, uh, the most uh, outrageous uh, resolutions that you can achieve observationally seem to be with very long baseline interferometry. And here's a, a zoom in picture of uh, the core of M87. And as you can see, uh, with the bubbles and so on that are being produced on uh, the core, cluster core scales of 10 kiloparsecs or so, uh, we've been zooming quite a lot, and we're still not even resolving the uh, accretion disk around the black hole. Uh, this is uh, six times the threshold radius there. Um, there are a number of deficiencies of the common approach, um, uh, and the common approach I would, uh, I would uh, call sort of ad hoc plausibility modeling. Um, Sometimes based on reasonable physical assumptions, sometimes based on rather sketchy ones. I can think of a star, particular star formation model introduced in the early 1990s in cosmological simulations that basically uh, made stars when the divergence of the velocity was zero when measured on scales that were then resolvable, uh, you know, maybe 100 kiloparsecs or uh, a megaparsec or more, um, which clearly uh, is not where stars form, they don't, they don't respond directly to the divergence of the velocity field on those scales. Um, they often contain a number of adjustable parameters. Franco was just being uh, harassed about uh, how many parameters this model contained. Uh, not all of these models, uh, not all of these parameters are, are physical. Some of them are, uh, some of them are not. Some of them relate to, uh, for instance, in AGN modeling, uh, how much of the, uh, of the grid nearby the AGN do you take gaps from? In deciding how much, you know, add, you know, in taking gas from the grid and adding it to the black hole, and that's a completely numerical parameter. And generally, the size of that region is much greater than the size of the region that actually does contribute mass directly to the black hole in a given time step. So, um, so not all of those uh, are physical. Uh, it may not converge with increasing resolution, and I would argue uh, convergence isn't necessarily even meaningful when you consider that. Um, uh, that, uh, well, I think uh, uh, Nick has mentioned this, that uh, these subgrid models are really only appropriate over a range of length scales. Uh, if, if you continue to converge after that, then you're just physically wrong. You may be numerically converging to a correct solution, but physically you're not converging to the correct solution because uh, the physics that's encoded in the subgrid model may simply be not well represented by the type of model you, you use on larger scales. An example here uh, is the uh, previously mentioned alpha Bondi approach to estimating the age and accretion rate uh, in cosmological and galaxy formation simulations. And I'm not going to name any names here because everybody does it. Uh, but basically, this, this model measures the gas density and the sound speed on kiloparsec scales, where it's basically sampling the hot intercluster medium. Right? And then it assumes that the, uh, the accretion rate onto the black hole is given by uh, some parameter alpha times the Bondi accretion rate, maybe sometimes modified to uh, you know be the Bondi Hoyle uh, Littleton accretion rate. But generally, this Bondi accretion rate, which um, which ignores the, uh, the flow of gas uh, past the uh, accretor, and this parameter alpha has values that range anywhere from one to a hundred or three hundred or so, right? and is definitely not necessarily uh, pinned down very well by observations. Um, Nevertheless, what we've done, uh, my uh, former student Karen Young and I, and uh, Paul Sutter, another former student, looked at what the effect of varying these various parameters that are used in AGM subgrid models would be on the, uh, on the observable properties of, of galaxy clusters within uh, a given overdensity radius. And uh, not surprisingly, the, uh, the observables that are most sensitive to the core properties have uh, the largest uncertainty. A lot of this is driven by uh, alpha. Uh, but it's also driven by some of the other parameters as well. So, uh, so just the theoretical uncertainty, if you will, that's introduced by these parameters, some numerical, some physical, uh, uh, is rather significant. 
Uh, a paper from the 1990s that I always found uh, kind of amusing was by Vittorio Camuto, uh, subgrid scale modeling, correct models and others. And, um, and this is coming from the turbulence community where they actually have a mathematically well-defined notion of what a subgrid model means, right? They take the Navier-Stokes equations and they, they uh, high pass, oh, sorry, low pass filter them and then there are additional terms there that then, you know, are integrals over things that they don't know on small scales. They make the assumption that the physics on those small scales is universal and relatively boundary independent. In other words, the scales that are large scales that, are, that do depend on the boundary conditions, the, integra uh, the uh, integral scale that's driving the turbulence, that gets solved using uh, some normal fluid solver. And then, uh, and then a model is used to represent these explicitly represented or explicitly defined um, terms that go into the Navier-Stokes equations uh, that represent small scales. And um, that's, that's the idea behind large eddy simulation, which is basically what everybody here is doing. You're not doing Reynolds average Navier-Stokes, for example. Uh, whether you know it or not, you're doing LES. And, um, and of course, the quality of your solution depends to a great extent on both the mathematical and physical consistency of the subgrid models that you're employing. And he, he shows that one of these subgrid models he's considering contradicts Galilean invariance, uh, employs an incorrect time scale, contradicts the Kolmogorov inertial law and the Richardson diffusion law, um, produces a, a, a larger turbulent vis viscosity than it should, basically a number of things that, where it falls down. And you might say, well, but, you know, maybe it makes intermittent structures on large scales that look like, you know, kind of what observations show. Yeah, but, it, you know, it also, it also violates a number of physical rules, and that probably means that other things about the flow are not representative or not reliable. Now, in the case of stars, which is what he's considering, that Reynolds numbers are really, really high. Okay. Um, but that illustrates, I think, the risks of, of not taking a physically uh, consistent approach towards subgrid modeling. And that approach, I think, uh, or at least a good step in that direction, was um, illustrated in Richard's, uh, Richard Bauer's talk yesterday, uh, where he, um, you know, he talked about basically doing simulations of the unresolved scales, you know, color parts like boxes or whatever, and then coarse graining those and using that to produce a library of fitted, um, fitted models for uh, plugging into large eddy simulations on larger scales. So that would be the ideal thing, would be to do direct numerical simulation, DNS, and then, uh, and then to tie that in uh, to directly into the uh, fluid equations as, uh, as well-represented source terms on the right-hand side of the equations. Now, um, switching, uh, switching grids just a little bit, uh, one thing we've also heard about a fair bit um, is the architectural constraints that are coming down the line, and, uh, and I concur with those who, uh, who argue that uh, our community, while it seems extremely important to us, is not going to have a whole lot of weight in driving the, uh, the development of these architectures. You know, we're, um, we're simply not going to uh, be the ones who, who get to say, well, you know, this is, really the, this is really the ideal architecture that we would like to have, and then, you know, and then Intel and uh, AMD and NVIDIA and so on will go, to, go back and, uh, and consider that very carefully in their designs. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to have to live with what the markets provide us. Okay. And what the market markets will provide us uh, will be unbalanced ar architectures in which uh, the number of bytes per flop are very different from one. Uh, as uh, Thomas Schultes uh, discussed this morning, the cost of a flop is very cheap in 2013. The cost of moving a 64-bit word from RAM is about a thousand times, at least a thousand times more expensive in terms of energy. Um, a nice conversion factor is one picojoule per operation corresponds to one megawatt per exaflop, and, or exaflop per second. And, uh, and so what this corresponds to then is more than a gigawatt per exaflop. So basically, we could build an exascale computer right now. Um, of course, keeping it uh, alive you know, would be another issue. But in order to actually operate it, we would have to also build a nuclear power plant. So. And that's assuming no network. Obviously, it'll cost even more data, more energy to move data from one place to another, one node to another. And uh, and while we can expect some improvement from technology in these numbers, it'll probably always be more expensive to move data around than it will be to compute on it. And so and so these architectures are going to get more and more 
uh, unbalanced. The second major development is that better performance is, even in today's machines, is increasingly driven or obtained through heterogeneous parallelism with high latency between levels. An example of this would be of the Blue Waters machine at NCSA, University of Illinois. Uh, this is a machine that's a combination Cray XE6 and Cray XK6, I think, 6. Um, and it's actually, these numbers are a little bit out of date. It's now been upgraded to 13 petaflops peak. Um, but as you can see, the XE part, the one that does not have, uh, uh, does not have uh, GPUs in it, has a peak performance of 7 petaflops, and it gains that through 360,000 uh, cores. And the XK part almost matches it, just within a factor of 2, 4.5 petaflops. It's got a much smaller number of, of uh, GPU or CPU cores, but so most of that, that 4.5 petaflops actually comes from, uh, from 3,000 XK uh, X, uh, Kepler accelerators. Most of that comes from that. And the, the upgrade I just mentioned, that was not to the XE6 part. That was to the XK6 part. So there are more GPUs in it now. So if you want to get that performance, if you want to use that machine to its fullest potential, you have to somehow find a way to make use of the accelerators. Right? Now, that's, that's kind of a problem because uh, of, uh, it, it's, the accelerators are generally just a very different kind of architecture. They don't just provide one additional level of parallelism, they provide two or three. Right? And they're oriented in a completely different way. The, um, the x86 host processor, the CPU, talks to host memory. It's got several layers of cache that are meant to, uh, to balance the fact that it's got, um, that, that, that talking to memory is high latency. Um, what the GPU does is it, it tolerates latency by basically rapidly switching between tasks. So it's set up to really, really efficiently do that. Um, it talks, it has a fair amount of memory itself. This is uh, the Fermi architecture. It's one, it's one level behind Kepler. Uh, it can talk directly to the host memory, but it does through this tiny little pipe. You know, it's basically, I drink your milk, I drink your milkshake, but I do through through a tiny little straw. And, and that straw uh, in today's machines is basically a PCI Express bus that goes at maybe 8 gigabytes per second. So if you, if you think, well, that means that I could transfer 8 gigabytes in a second, but a second is forever. Right? So that's not, you don't want to transfer very much data over this bus if you want, if you want good performance. And, and so what a lot of people seem to do when they, when they say, I want to speed up my code with a GPU, is they say, well, I've got a, I've got a ginormous array on the host that I want to update with this time step. And I want to basically get that to run faster, so I take some of that array and I move it over to the GPU a lot of times, and then I do stuff on it and I bring it back. And I just try to get the best performance I can by only sending over as much as I need. But they're still sending a lot of data. That, I would argue, is not the, the best way to approach this. What makes more sense is to map, find a way to map the problems that we're interested in onto the machine that we have available to us. Now, uh, massively parallel machines used to be set up so they'd have like a hybrid porous type communication topology. Why was that? Well, that was very good for uniform grid hydrodynamics, right? For solving partial differential equations on a uniform grid, uh, with per especially with periodic boundary conditions, right? So what kind of problem would map naturally onto this kind of architecture where we have um, a big network with a, a, some large number of CPUs uh, each of which is attached to local accelerators, uh, but that drinks through a very thin straw. Well, this seems like a natural fit for subgrid modeling. Uh, the idea here would be then that uh, here where we've got this global coupling, we handle the large scales that can be directly simulated. Right? And then on small scales, we handle the more or less universal, uh, more or less boundary, weak, weakly dependent on boundary condition physics, uh, that doesn't need to talk directly to other local regions. What's more, we do so in a way that, we, that uh, transfers as little information as possible between the large scales and the small scales. So in other words, if we had, say, for instance, a miniature hydro simulation on the accelerator, most of that hydro simulation would just exist on the accelerator. Right? We would never send the whole grid back, never, never. So we are uh, working on 
something I call the uh, Sub-Resolution Accelerator Framework, or SAF, or SAF. The basic idea here is to do a direct numerical simulation for the small-scale universal physics. And that could be that could be accretion, that could be star formation, that could be uh, turbulent dissipation, that could be a wide range of things. And the idea here then is that it couples to the large scales through the mid-scale boundary data. That is, for instance, you've got a main grid, and you interpolate to get boundary conditions for small hydro simulations that are done on the GPU. Then the GPU uh, itself, which is which is taking care of all the hydro data for this miniature simulation, coarse grains the result and sends it back to the main processor. Now, this sounds just like adaptive measure coming in, but there's a key difference. Uh, again, remember the remember that memory is not going to scale with flops, right? So the idea here is that. Uh, the uh, universal physics is not only local in space, but it's also relatively local in time. The time scales that are appropriate for star formation are much shorter than the time scales you want to take on the main grid. Uh, so, so these DNS solves on the subgrid are ephemeral. That is, you throw away the data and start anew uh, on the next uh, on the next subgrid so. So the idea, the advantages here would be is more physical than these, uh, than these plausibility subgrid models. It's actually trying to be well-founded in terms of boundary uh, information and, and in terms of uh, filtering of scales. Um, and, uh, and it also exploits the architecture. It actually gains from the architecture by uh, taking advantage of the fact that there's relatively weak interscale coupling. So there's not much data that really needs to move between scales. Uh, so what this particular framework that we've developed will do is to provide a code agnostic toolkit to make this happen efficiently. So the idea is that you've got your Renzi's or you've got ART or Flash or Enzo or, or even maybe SPH codes. And uh, as long as you can provide me with a little patch of data on a uniform grid that you pass to a subroutine that I provide, um, I will do subgrid update and then pass back the results to you. And the, result, and the data you pass to me uh, should be not only a grid at a particular time, but maybe a save value if you, if you can provide that. Then I can do interpolation on boundaries both in time and in space. Now this opens up a pretty wide uh, parameter space of ways we could transfer information between the two scales and also ways in which we could do the coarse graining, not to mention the various types of subgrid models that we uh, can imagine implementing. Um, but the idea here is that this framework provides sort of a, a you know, an easy way to plug into uh, and, uh, and to handle some of, the, uh, some of the data movement in ways that are uh, sort of common to all the possibilities that you might want to work with. So, so this, uh, this is some of what I, uh, what I just said. The idea is that we have a template region which may be only one zone, maybe more than one zone on the main grid. Um, on, uh, on the CPU, we compute interpolants to this boundary here. We send that, the coefficients for those interpolants to the uh, GPU, which uses it to initialize the, uh, the subgrid. It does hydro using boundary conditions generated from these interpolants. And then at the end of the time step, the end of the main grid time step, it coarse grains and sends the results back. And the results here, as you can see, if, if you had a three by three region here for your template region, that would only be nine numbers, basically, per variable that you needed to send back. This is a very small amount of data by design that needs to be sent. Now, we've implemented this using uh, a, a type of hydro scheme that doesn't seem to be commonly used in astrophysics, but I think, I think deserves a, a lot more consideration. This is a kurganov padmore central difference scheme. Uh, it's a second-order PVD scheme that admits of a semi-discrete version, so you could actually integrate it not just with a second-order integrator, but you could actually also use one big cutter, for example. It does not require a Riemann solver. So there's no expensive, painful characteristic decomposition. And most importantly, because of that, uh, since you can operate on the, the equations component-wise, it makes it very easy to extend the equations to include source terms that are local, that are actually physically well modeled. Right? So if you want to add cooling, if you want to add gravity, whatever, you know, you do so in a mathematically self-consistent way, and then it's not it's not painful to get that into a discrete solver. Whereas with, with a Riemann solver, I think anybody who's actually tried that, you know, knows that that's not, not a friendly experience. Uh, there's a first order version of it uh, called local lax Friedrichs or Rizanov method. Um, and that's the one we've got implemented on the separate right now. We have a, a, a sort of a test harness code 
uh, called Driver that, uh, that uses the second order Cardano Tadmor scheme. Uh, here's a test of that on the setoff problem. As you can see, that uh, produces a pretty sharp uh, interface here at the, the shock. Um, but the idea is that eventually, you know, once we have this, once we're satisfied with this, uh, we'll start using it in codes like Flash. And my intention is to make the SAF available uh, online for people uh, to, to download and use with their own codes. And hopefully we can, you know, if there's enough interest, could set up a, a, a sort of a marketplace of, uh, of uh, subgrid models for people to use with it. Um, so as I said, it's got source terms and dual energy formulas and directly incorporated into the solver. Right now I've implemented constant and linear boundary interpolation. Um, you know, I intend to go beyond that. And we're using OpenEC. In fact, uh, in two days last week, I, uh, I took this from a purely GPU code or CPU code and made it into CPU plus GPU code. And, um, and I'll show you the performance that we got from that relatively simple procedure um, in a moment. So this is just a very preliminary test. If you show it to anybody, I'll find out where you live. Uh, and I think uh, Naoki's zero particle simulation uh, notwithstanding, I am showing the smallest simulation at this conference. 65 cube main grid. So this is right now just running on a single node, right? This is just uh, just a test problem. And, um, and uh, we're doing the body accretion problem for uh, parameter settings similar to actually we're using as a, as a basis for this test um, uh, from Holtz, uh, McKee, and Klein. Uh, am I beyond my time or how much? Okay. Well, I, I'm close to finishing. Okay. So anyway, so, um, anyway so, so you can see that there's still some glitches there we need to get working out. I, I think that there's a lot of space that needs to be explored with the interpolants. So, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, so this is what the uh, Krimholz et al. Uh, solver, and this is what a couple of different sizes of template regions, and it's, as you can see, it's sensitive to that. Okay, so, um, almost done. Sorry, I was expecting your hand, but I miss it. I'm sorry. Um, all right, so this is, so one of the advantages of OpenEdit is that you can run the same code on the CPU and on the GPU, and it's just a matter of compiler flags, which it does. Um, so we've run it uh, for different subgrid sizes and different main grid sizes. Each of these three curves is a different main grid size. And as long as the subgrid is much smaller than the main grid, of course, the CPU calculation dominates, and the GPU doesn't provide any advantage. But as the subgrid starts to get bigger, uh, then the GPU's performance on it uh, gets big, better and better compared to the CPUs until it saturates at about a factor of eight or nine times faster than the CPU. And this is considering the fact that um, that the uh, GPU is actually doing more time steps on the subgrid than it is uh, that the CPU is doing on the main grid. So, um, uh, so that and that and that's because of two days worth of effort. So we didn't do anything special telling the compiler to you know take advantage of the Fermi architecture. We just use this default settings. In terms of absolute time for main grid time step, uh, as you'd expect, the time for main grid time step uh, to do the main grid increases as a cube of the main grid size. Uh, for each of the subgrids, uh, right now the crossing point seems to be about at, at the point where the main grid size is equal to the subgrid size. So what this means is that for each main grid patch, we could have about one zone or one region, let's say, uh, that is done on the subgrid. So if you had, for instance, an AMR patch in which one AGM lived, then then this actually gets you uh, just a factor of two more expense to get uh, a, a very accurate, hopefully very accurate, uh, subgrid representation of the AGM. Um, and if you tried to do that on the CPU, you know, it would be a tap factor of 20 times slower. So the GPU really makes this possible. Right? It's not just, oh, I have to live with the GPU. I'm taking advantage of the GPU. All right, just to summarize, uh, we got this performance uh, with just a little bit of open act work because we designed the algorithm from the beginning to involve small amounts of data transfer between uh, layers of parallelism. So, uh, so I think we're going to have to do more of that. Uh, one way to do this is to, as I said, is to do this local ephemeral DNS with weak coupling to the main grid. This framework that I'm building with uh, with Gary, uh, we want to make public. We want to uh, we want to encourage the development of maybe a collective library of subgrid routines that actually uh, that actually can benefit the entire community. And just to end, I want to thank Nvidia. I think there was supposed to be an Nvidia guy here, and thank you, Nvidia guy. 
we, we got a uh, Tesla C2075 and Quadro 6000 available through the Professor Partnership Program. Um, that's what made this, this whole thing possible. Thank you.